If I'm gonna be completely honest, morality is a mess. And that's gonna become more and more clear as we go deeper down the iceberg of morality. Alright, so before we start, if you're not familiar with the iceberg format, it pretty much works in such a way that we have a picture of an iceberg, which is supposed to represent the subject that we're going to be exploring. And the deeper down we go on this iceberg, the more complex and the more creepy the concepts that we're covering within the subject becomes. And surprisingly, when it comes to morality, there are actually a ton of creepy and complex topics that I will be covering in this video. And there actually aren't that many iceberg videos about this topic on YouTube, so let's start with the video. So yeah, let's start with the definition. So what is morality? I would say that it's the field of using reasoning to decide if something ought or should happen from an unselfish perspective. So pretty much what action or what outcome is preferable. Or I mean, you could also just say right or wrong. Yeah, I guess that's easier now when I think about it. So let's start by taking a look at one of the most popular problems in ethics, the trolley problem. A train is on its way to run over five people who are standing on the train tracks. Or I mean, in this picture they're actually laying. You have a lever in front of you and you can either pull the lever. And if you do pull the lever, then the train will switch track to the track to the right side of the original track where one person is laying or sitting or standing and drive over that person instead of the five other people who are on the original track, effectively saving five people on the expense of another life. All right, so what is the solution to this problem? What we ought to do. Do we pull the lever? Do we not pull the lever? Oh my god, this is too confusing. Shh. There are a couple approaches that we can take, but let's start by figuring out why this is even a dilemma to begin with. The cause of the dilemma is that we often have a bias towards the natural flow of events, and we believe if the natural sequence of events is stopped or changed, then the outcome of the events are now the responsibility of the being that changed the sequence of events. If we apply this reasoning in this case, it would imply that whatever happens after the agent pulls the lever is his responsibility because he pulled the lever. But what makes this a bias and illogical is that if the agent does not pull the lever, then it is assumed that he's not responsible for the outcome which is five people dying because it's not changing the natural flow of events which doesn't really make any sense because there isn't really a thing called the natural flow of events and there's no universe that is the default universe and therefore there's no sequence of events that is supposed to happen so regardless of the original state of the chain it still makes sense to me that you still ought to pull the lever to minimize the number of deaths and to minimize suffering wait wait a minute what i used to do there is that i applied what they call it in philosophical literature the utilitarian framework which is a framework based on the notion that you ought to minimize suffering and maximize happiness or utility regardless of the action at hand but there are also other ways of looking at the problem if you follow a deontological framework then you have a set of actions that are considered morally bad and if killing someone is a part of those actions and pulling the lever is considered killing then pulling the lever would be something you ought not to do and you should instead just wait for the train to run over the five people by the way this is called formal logic which is a way of typing logic with symbols and math instead of using words and yeah it looks sick and you can also use something called virtue ethics no I'm joking, you actually can't. I don't see why so many people categorize virtue ethics in the same way of deontology and the utilitarianism. Because virtue ethics is more of a system that looks at a person's goodness, or as the old Greek people would call it, virtues, by examining how they respond to different situations. It's not like the other frameworks where you determine if the action itself is good or bad. Either way, one other term that might be relevant is consequentialism. For a framework to be consequential, it needs to determine the preferability of the action based on the outcome. So for example, utilitarianism is a consequential sequentialistic framework while the ontology is not all right so now we have covered pretty much the two main frameworks or i mean three with the virtue ethics but as i said i don't know what virtue ethics is doing here these are the normative frameworks right the normative ethical theories and they're usually used as a consistent method to solve these moral dilemmas and i think the end goal of these moral frameworks is to try to represent the human mind's moral compass in the best way possible by using like a consistent theory and framework but the issue is that they don't and i will explain why i believe that both of these frameworks are bound to cause inconsistency inconsistencies if applied in real life. And what I mean by inconsistencies in this context is that most average people would still find the action that ought to happen ridiculous even though it logically follows using the framework. I will give some further examples to demonstrate. Let's say you needed to kill a person to save the entirety of humanity. Of course this is a very unrealistic scenario but in this situation a deontological framework would probably not work if you don't already have a rule which states if the entirety of humanity would be gone if you did not kill a person you ought to kill that person. Existed. So because if you have a rule which goes against killing, then uh, you might not be able to kill the person to save humanity. Without that other specific rule, the flaws in this framework are vindicated when you test it with a specific scenario where an extreme happiness or utility outcome in one of the alternatives is present. But it also involves the breaking of one of the deontological rules. The only solution to this problem from a deontological view would just be to create more rules that are even more specific so that you cover every possible scenario. Like if you were coding a program and you just had to keep on adding if statements instead of having like an overarching algorithm to just solve 
solve for all of the inputs. This is what the utilitarian approach tries to fix, but doesn't succeed in that because of some other reasons that I will explain now. Alright, so I'm just gonna give an example. Let's imagine that we have a person who kills himself painlessly, and this person was also extremely sad and he would have had a miserable life if he kept on living. And this person doesn't either have any family or friends who cares about him. From a utilitarian perspective, this act of killing oneself would have been preferable and good and something you ought to do in this context because it increases net happiness by inhibiting future sadness. This is what I like to call the problem with net negative lives and moral relativity. And yes, we're getting deep now. I mean, moral relativity, I, I, I mean, it sounds kind of cool, right? But it actually makes sense. If you subscribe to a utilitarian framework, there must come a point in which life is net negative and therefore not preferable, meaning that it would be better if it was not true and therefore died or never existed. The relativity part comes from the fact that this net negative point is often inconsistent and relative in people's minds to the context of the subject, which creates contradictions. Some people even believe that we're all net negative and that it would be better if consciousness and sentience never appeared in the universe to begin with. And yeah, that's pretty sad if you ask me. But either way, an example that picks on this relativity part is the historical utility increase. What I mean by that is over time, well-being has probably increased, at least on paper, or assets. I talk more about this in the Humanity The Joke of the Universe video. But because of this probable happiness increase, people today do not prefer a kid to be born if he for example only has a 60% chance of dying before turning to the age of 15. No, never mind, has a 60%, not only has a... Yeah, that didn't make any sense. I think I should have phrased it only has a 40% chance of surviving to the age of 15. But yeah, whatever. This would kind of imply though that kids shouldn't really have been born during that time frame when that was the reality of the human condition. Or that it would be better if someone like that just died painlessly so the person wouldn't have to suffer, right? Like that would logically follow using the utilitarian framework. But most people would still disagree with that. Like most people would still, you know, prefer that the kids should not be killed painlessly and should actually be born. And this demonstrates one of the contradictions which are are created using the utilitarian frameworks in comparison to the, you know, human mind's moral compass. And in the same way, people in the future might look back at our life as unpreferable and negative in accordance to utilitarianism. Another contradiction in this line of thought is that it would imply that it's fine to kill a slave painlessly who doesn't have any family or friends who love him, because presumably slavery is bad, right? And a slave's life is unpreferable and therefore should not exist. But I just realized that I should probably explain why I say who doesn't have any friends or family that loves him. Like some people might be really confused why I say this oddly specific line that the person in context doesn't have any friends or family that loves him. Like wh what is this channel? I say it because if the subject has friends or family, that might cause an external utility decrease. Meaning that the friends and family would probably get sad if the subject dies and therefore it decreases net happiness or utility. But there is one argument that can respond to the historical utility increase dilemma and that is the argument for future utility increase. It follows that the beings who were suffering back then are still preferable because they created potential for beings in the future to experience happiness. So the kids that were born and died during the historical times still ought to exist because they increased future utility and when you think about it all utility that we're talking about in moral dilemmas are future based utility just by different distances of time but the issue with this and almost all moral frameworks is that it requires the alien to know the full future of the universe and it becomes extra complicated because it seems like humanity is exponentially growing and therefore the average happiness experience or the average utility experience should weigh more right now than it did back then because we have more people alive right now but this doesn't actually solve the suicide or slave killing problem but we'll go over that later on in the video and what the actual core issue with utilitarianism is. But before we do that, let's cover one other, you know, argument or problem which people use to debunk utilitarianism. That is the organ stealing dilemma. Let's say we have two universes. In both of these universes, there is a hospital and there's people working at the hospitals and there's five patients who all of them require organs. And if they do not get their organs, they just die. And now, let's imagine that there is a person walking in the hospital for a checkout. And this person walking in the hospital for a checkout has perfectly fine organs. <laughs> so this is where the two universes are split. So in the first universe, the person just gets a checkout and uh, nothing happens and the five people eventually die. But in the second universe, the hospital workers just steal the organs from the person who's getting a checkout and supply them to the other five people so that they survive but this other random person who's just getting a checkout dies. Alright, so if we were to apply utilitarian logic to this dilemma, we should just choose the second option and take the organs and give them away to the other five people to minimize suffering. But this seems kind of wrong. Even though this problem looks kind of similar to the other trolley problem that we talked about earlier, it still seems wrong to minimize suffering in this case compared to the other case. Well, why is this the case? <laughs> 
those were a lot of cases, but doesn't this like entail a contradiction? Because the only difference is pretty much the context of the people. On the trolley problem, people just intuitively think that it's better to switch tracks and drive over only one person. But when it comes to this issue, which is very similar to the trolley problem, it seems like the only difference is the context. People do not take the utilitarianism minimized suffering approach, instead they go for the deontological rules approach, thinking that it's just unfair that your organs can just be stolen like that. Wait, 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 that's the keyword, fair. It could just be that we have a biological preferability to fairness. And it seems unfair to just steal some random guy's organs compared to the trolley problem where it's kind of, you know, their fault that they're on the train tracks, right? Like, what are they doing there? As I wander along the desolate terrain, my gaze is drawn to the glinting steel of the train tracks. Their slick lines and symmetrical rails are an irresistible siren call, beckoning me closer. I cannot resist their hypnotic allure, and so, I succumb to the seductive call of the tracks, carefully positioning myself upon their surface. As I lay here, my body fully extended, limbs splayed out in a state of repose. I am fully cognizant of the potential danger, yet I am unable to resist the hypnotic pull of the tracks. My senses are heightened, as I am fully immersed in the moment, relishing the sensation of the steel rails against my flesh. I cannot bring myself to leave this captivating spot. The train tracks have seduced me, and I am powerless to their enchantment. Uh, but no, we don't actually know how they got on the train tracks. We can't just assume that all of that happened. We can't actually take for granted that it was their fault playing on the train tracks and that it's their responsibility. And then use that as a justification to pull the lever and switch the track. Let's instead say that in the trolley problem, the six people were just randomly selected. So they were just wandering around in their normal life and then just boom, randomly got teleported to this train track and it's now stuck. And let's also assume that the people who had failing organs in the organ problem were also just selected randomly. They're not responsible for it. It wasn't their fault that the organs just stopped working. They didn't like shove a sword into their chest, there were just random people. And now, because we have exposed the randomness in both of the scenarios, the fairness has equalized. And it doesn't seem so bad anymore to use the utilitarian approach to minimize suffering in both of the dilemmas. So pretty much, steal his organs, it's fine. But it still seems kind of weird. And the reason why it seems weird is because we have like an organized society, which makes it so our organs can't just be stolen at random. And that is kind of a relaxing feeling when you think about it. You know, don't take anything for granted. But the reason why this doesn't really apply in this hypothetical is because this could have just been a one-time thing like this doesn't have to be repeated and it also doesn't have to be publicly you know acknowledged no one has to know about this this could just be a, a secret thing that just occurred randomly and it's sort of just like a quick trade you know like instead of losing five lives we lose one life I mean, it seems kind of fair to me. All right, now to another part of the iceberg. Should we strive to create a world with a small number of extremely happy individuals or a world with a large population of less happy people? This question actually has some interesting implications. On one hand, if we prioritize a large population, this would imply that we ought to strive to maximize the number of people alive so that more individuals can experience happiness. However, if we believe that a small number of extremely happy individuals is preferable, this would suggest that we should decrease the population so that each person has access to more resources and potentially greater greater happiness. But yeah, that's about it for this part. You could probably make some like interesting movies about that, like some people in like cages and uh, living in this like hyper dense world, just trying to maximize the amount of people alive, or, or on the other end of the spectrum, just trying to minimize the people. Yeah, I don't know. Moving on to the next one. Now, let's clear up some definitions. Utilitarianism is built on happiness and sadness, and they call it the spectrum of utility, where negative utility is sadness and positive utility is happiness. But what is utility? How does one experience utility? Well, I do talk about this in my Too Much Happiness is Scary video, but the video is kind of old, and for some reason I rendered it in 720p without noticing it before I uploaded the video. So yeah, I will cover it quickly here as well. I define happiness as having serotonin or dopamine in the synapse and having it be picked up by a receptor. This is when the feeling of happiness is experienced in my opinion. But even if this is not the case, having less receptors will still result in less neurons firing, or as the neuroscientists would call it, less action potentials. And that might be why people do not experience the same level of happiness when they lose some of the receptors. And the reason why I emphasize this is because if that was not the case, then you could just artificially pump a bunch of serotonin and dopamine into your brain, and we would be super happy. But this doesn't seem to be the case, because when people take drugs and so on, they kind of become sad afterwards, and I believe that this is a result of having lower amounts of receptors. And I also think the brain just produces less of these chemicals as well after like an overstimulation. And uh, let's just say that the definition of sadness is when your body like detects tissue damage and inputs that to the brain or just overall low levels of these other happiness chemicals. But the problem with this and the spectrum of utility is that we don't actually know exactly how much utility an action should cause. We may know in a general sense that for example pushing someone is less worse than stabbing someone but we don't actually know exactly how much less worse pushing someone is than stabbing someone. <laughs> like how many pushes equals one stab so all of these numbers are essentially arbitrary and we can't really quantify it in the same way as we can quantify other sort of things. Though if we had like a super
super advanced computer and a super advanced brain scanning system and we also had like a stable definition of sadness and happiness then we may actually be able to like calculate sadness and happiness with exact numbers but yeah for now we're just gonna think in a general sense and assign arbitrary numbers that sort of make sense at least make sense enough that you can prove the downsides and benefits of different ethical theories now to another part of the iceberg threshold deontology threshold deontology tries to solve the problems with utilitarianism and deontology by combining utilitarianism and deontology into one single framework threshold deontology works by analyzing the difference in the utility outcome between the different alternatives in a problem if the utility difference between the different alternatives exceeds a specific amount or threshold then the problem will be looked at from a utilitarian perspective but if it does not exceed this amount then the problem will be dealt with from a deontological perspective for example consider a scenario where a person is either murdered or not murdered because the difference in the utility outcomes between the two alternatives is relatively small and does not exceed the specific amount that is specified in the framework we will look at the problem from a deontological perspective and use our deontological rules and one of those rules may be it's wrong to take a life but now let's say if the person does not get murdered a hundred million people die in this case because the difference in utility outcome is so high the threshold deontological framework will use the utilitarian logic to determine that the universe without the mass suffering is the preferable universe and the thing with this framework is that it not only solves the deontological problems but also the utilitaristic problems Okay, I don't know if you can see utilitaristic. Uh, I don't think that's an actual word, but whatever. For example, in this framework, you can't just kill people even though their future life may not seem to be the best. Because one of those deontological rules might go against that. But there are still issues with this framework. Oh, I almost forgot about the graph. So the graph that I've been showing you guys is pretty much a graphical representation of the threshold deontological framework. So on this graph, we can see that the y-axis is moral value given by a specific action. And then our x-axis is well-being minus suffering, which is pretty much just utility. And at the bottom of the graph, we have the deontological line, which has this bluish purplish color. And you can see that this line is just constant throughout the graph, right? It's just a straight line. So it doesn't care about the utility and the consequences of the action, just like how you would expect a deontological rule to look like on a graph where the x-axis is well-being minus suffering. So now let's take a look at the red line. So you can see that the red line moves linearly with utility. So that's utilitarianism. So as utility increases with a specific action, the moral value of that specific action also increases linearly and vice versa. Now let's take a look at the line in the middle. So the line in the middle has the same slope as the utilitaristic line, but it's actually offset by a bit. And this offset is actually equal to the deontological line, which means that to get the line in the middle, you pretty much take the utilitaristic line minus the deontological line, and you will have this line in the middle and as you may have guessed the line in the middle is threshold deontology so let's just think about this i think the best way to understand this is to test it out with a specific scenario because this graph can't represent all scenarios at once because of the deontological line which pretty much only represents one deontological rule being broken but there may be multiple rules in a deontological system and those rules may all have different moral values given to them if broken so let's assume that because the deontological line is below the x-axis we can pretty much assume that the action is quite bad right like it's a pretty bad action so let's Let's just assume that it's murder. Let's take murder as an example. So let's first try it with the normal case, which means that the outcome, the utility outcome of the murder will be negative. So it will be on the left side of the y axis, which means that all of our three frameworks will say that the action is unpreferable and bad. So we can see that our utilitaristic framework says that it's bad, and our threshold deontological framework says that it's bad, and our deontological framework says that it's bad. But let's now test it with the reductio. So let's say that the murder actually resulted in net positive utility, so well being actually increased. This would mean that the utilitaristic framework would justify the action and say that it's a good action to do while the deontological framework would say that it's still bad right because it doesn't care about the utility now comes the interesting part so the threshold deontological line will pretty much justify the action if the utility is high enough right so it's not enough to say that it causes positive utility it actually needs to cause a lot of positive utility for us to justify the action to be more specific it actually needs to cause so much more positive utility so that the deontological offset is outweighed by the positive utility so pretty much if the result of murdering someone is just saving two people then we could still say that that action is bad following threshold deontology because the deontological constant which is created as a result of breaking the rule outweighs the positive utility then you can also say on the other end of the spectrum that if the action of killing someone resulted in a bunch of people being saved and a bunch of net happiness so that it outweighs the deontological constant it would imply that it's actually justified to do that action and actually good so it pretty much covers both of the cases and creates a well-rounded system so that you can eat your cake and still have it pretty much.
All right, now to a deeper part of the iceberg, the non-constant sentience universe problem. So in our universe, we encounter a multitude of beings, each with their own unique brain and consciousness, which often fluctuates over time instead of being constant. For example, all creatures die and therefore lose consciousness. All creatures are also born and therefore gain consciousness, at least most of them. This means that we need to account for the changes in consciousness in our utility calculation and we can simply not use go of happiness outcome. Because I would assume that most of us would agree that a creature with higher sentience should impact the utility calculation more than a being of lesser sentience, presumably because the subjective experience of the being would be more vivid for the former and less vivid for the latter. However, determining the exact extent to which sentience should impact our calculations is a difficult task. So how do we address the issue of non-constant sentience in threshold deontology? One approach is to factor in the level of sentience when calculating utility. Let's say we're faced with the decision to sacrifice either three rats or one kangaroo. We can assign each creature a sentience coefficient, denoted by s, and then multiply the value by the units of the utility denoted by u that is experienced by the creature. Given that the sentience level of the rat is lower than that of the kangaroo, and also that the utility experienced by the kangaroo and the rats are the same, the product of s and u for the rat will be smaller. However, because there are three rats and only one kangaroo, it may actually be more ethical to sacrifice the kangaroo instead of the three rats, even though they have lower sentience than the kangaroo, so the decision will be based on how much utility the creatures experience and also what their sentience level is at. Alright, this all makes sense, but how do we determine the sentience coefficients? How do we measure sentience? Like, what if the rat actually had higher sentience than the kangaroo, and we started slaughtering a bunch of rats in the name of virtue? So the truth is that it's quite hard and complicated to measure or identify consciousness, so I will make a separate video about that. Alright, so we have solved the utilitarianism problem, added the ontological problem, and I mean kind of the sentience problem? But guess what? There are more problems. <laughs> so now we're gonna go really deep down in the iceberg. Like if you search up the specifics of what we're discussing right now, you'll probably not find any answers. Like not even ChatGPT will give you a concrete sentence. Death. We humans don't really like death, usually. But there are different ways of dying. For example, if you were gonna die in 10 minutes because you're 90 years old, but then you get kidnapped by the North Korean CIA and they start torturing you for about 2 minutes, and then they dump you in the sea where one shark and three jellyfishes are ready to bite you and touch you? No, that can't be right. Rub you? No, wait, what do yellowfishes do? Oh, they sting you. Okay. Whew. And then after that interesting experience, you get dragged up from the water by a kangaroo and some rats with deep unresolved trauma who are not gonna cope by intensely staring at you. And then after questioning what in the actual fuck is going on with the universe, you die and then a random frog pieces on your corpse. So presumably it would be better if you just died of natural causes 10 minutes earlier, or maybe you enjoyed that last part, or you were dead, right? So I'm not sure how you would experience that. Yeah, that joke didn't make any sense. But the conclusion is that there was so much suffering before your death that you would probably prefer to just die earlier so you didn't have to experience all of that suffering. But usually this is not the case. Usually we're expected to live a happy life and therefore it's not preferable to die earlier. And usually to exceed this cutoff point where it's actually better to just die, you need to be expected to experience a lot of suffering in the future. Like you probably need to be tortured for the rest of your life to justify something like that. But this creates another problem. Oh my god. If you die earlier, then presumably you leave room for one more to be born, so that the utility sum gets balanced out. Let's say the utility sum is the sum of utility in the universe during a specific time interval. So let's say we're looking at the time period between 1900 and 2000. World War II has started and ended, women get to vote, first man landed on the moon, and the first teddy bear was invented during this time. I mean, that's pretty cool, I can't lie. And the population has grown from 1.5 billion to 6.1 billion. And let's say one of those people are called John. John is 30 years old, he cooks, he works, and he does whatever that is. Yo, people were weird back then. And now he's dead. He could have lived 50 years more, but he died, and because he died, the population of Earth during this time saw another extremely short dip of one person. But because of this dip, there is now space for one more person to be born, and therefore Earth's population chooses to have one more kid. Or I mean, the population doesn't choose to have one more kid, it only happens as a result of probabilities. But either way, because of this, the positive utility that Yon did not get to experience is now balanced out by the fact that there is another person alive to experience that positive utility. So the net flow of utility is still the same, and the net sum of utility during this period is also the same. 
Wait, 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 chill with the music. This doesn't make any sense. Would it not be preferable if Jonius didn't die in early death and the Kidius wasn't born? Yeah, it kind of would. It at least feels that way. But if we look at our calculations, it seems like both of the universes have the same net utility. Or it might actually be that the universe where John dies actually has greater utility because John does not have to experience the last years of his life. And his space and time is instead replaced by a younger person who might be able to experience more happiness during that time interval that John missed because he would be younger and healthier than John would be during his last 40 years of his life. But yeah, this line of thinking causes a bunch of reductios. Reductios are pretty much absurd long-term conclusions or observations about one's arguments. In this case, the reductio would be that we should just kill old people so that new healthy people could be born, and therefore increasing utility by doing so, because presumably young people experience more utility per second. And let's also make that a new term, utility per second. Though this is assuming that the person gets replaced, and that the replacement happens fast enough so that it doesn't have a big impact on the utility sum. And the notion of a person getting replaced as they die is not necessarily true. I mean, it could be that John was just a really hardworking man, so that his death resulted in less resources being available. Or it could just be that the rest of the population just goes wild and just take up more resources per person now that John is gone, instead of just leaving a bit of free room so that another person could be added to the population. So yeah, as I said, this is a reductio, meaning that the conclusion is absurd, and most people would of course not want a world which looks like this. And I think the reason why this is the case is because we humans find an intrinsic worth in the maintenance of sentience, regardless regardless of future utility increase. So regardless if John's death resulted in higher net utility, it is still unpreferable that he dies because simply death is not nice. And yeah, that rhymes. So that's pretty cool. But yes, this might seem absurd that we have spent all of this time just realizing that death is not nice. But what we have actually done is that we have found all of the aspects that the average human moral compass values. And with this knowledge and with all of these things, we can incorporate them into one grand system of ethics. But it's not only the death itself which matters, it is also the time of the death and some other aspects. It seems like it's generally true that the earlier the death occurs, or the closer to birth the sentience is lost, I'm just gonna use them interchangeably, and the higher the sentience is of the being dying, the worse the death is, or the more unpreferable the death is. But before we cover the system of ethics that I kind of <laughs> kind of came up with, we first need to cover why we should even think about ethics in this manner. Like why even think about morality this deeply, and why logic and systems are even needed in this context. And the truth is that they're not needed most of the time. For example, if you were going out shopping for groceries, you don't have to whip out the physics or biology book and start calculating how much force your body will output during the week, and then convert that into calories to make an educated guess on how many apples you should buy. Instead, we usually just use our gut and our instinct to figure out how many apples we should buy, because calculating it would take too much effort and data. But now, on the contrary, if you were a country and you were heading into a cold winter and needed to ration during the summer, you would get a team of experts and calculate how much food is needed so that no one will starve to death. I believe we should use moral systems in the same way. Most everyday choices can be based on feelings, but I think it makes sense to have a stable logical ground for big political decisions, but there isn't. While it is true that we can use direct democracy and just let the public decide, and thereby aligning ourselves with the common moral system, this is usually not like a very effective way of steering a country. Instead, these decisions are usually decided by a small group of individuals who do not necessarily share the public system of morality, or they might even not agree with each other on a clear, consistent moral foundation. I believe that a tree is the best comparison to make. Sure, we have teams of experts in physics and biology to make sure that people live healthy lives and so that people don't just die of different causes. And these teams determine what decisions to make based on upsides and downsides. But the deeper you go into the upsides and downsides of the different alternatives, the closer you will come to the truck of the tree, which is the moral system that holds all of our non-selfish decisions in logic. And the problem with this is that our experts are not only basing their decisions on the branches of the tree, but also the truck of the tree. While it's true that we agree on like the scientific method of doing things, it is not true that we have a scientific consensus about what the moral system should look like at the base of the tree. And this puts the whole tree at risk of falling, and in our case, society falling. Okay, maybe that was a bit overdramatic, but you know, you, you get my point. For example, a scientist might argue with another scientist about the response to, let's say, a virus outbreak. No outbreak in particular, let's just say it's a hypothetical one, meaning not a real one. YouTube, please don't block this video. Okay, both scientists have the same data and the same scientific knowledge, but they disagree on how to handle the outbreak of this very hypothetical, non-existent virus. But why? Why would they disagree? If they have the same knowledge and the same data, shouldn't they be in consensus? Shouldn't their conclusion be the same? 
The problem is in the word scientific knowledge, because it does not involve morality. So the scientists can share the same scientific knowledge, but not the same underlying scientific system or morality, and that might cause their conclusions to be different. But if both scientists share the same moral system, then this dispute would be solved, and they would both be able to calculate the best path forward using logic. Now, it is possible that people will always disagree on the fundamental moral system. In that case, it may be more productive to focus on the branches of the tree rather than the truck. It is also possible that the final outcome or the future prospects of these various alternatives in many of these problems are so far apart that regardless of the moral framework employed, such as the ontology or utilitarianism, the decision that ought to be made would remain concordant. In that case, it makes more sense to focus on approaching or achieving the desired outcome or alternative rather than dwelling on the intricacies of the ethical system in use. But I still believe that there is likely a moral system that the majority of people can agree on and that our human minds and moral compasses are generally in line with. This system can then be used as a base for logical reasoning. But the thing is that you can't prove morality. You can only say, yeah, that makes sense and then continue talking. There is really no such thing as right or wrong decisions. There are only contradictions within a given moral system or set of premises. That's at least what I believe. However, others propose the concept of objective morality, which suggests that there are certain actions that are objectively right or wrong, regardless of culture or individual perspectives. The idea suggests that there are certain moral truths that are universal and unchanging, and that it's possible to make objective moral decisions based on these truths, like it is embedded in the physical laws of the universe. Either way, to conclude the previous point, it seems like the gain of having like a fundamental moral system is that people will find it easier to understand each other's reasoning, and we might also be able to input this system into an artificial intelligence. We can then base its research and actions on the system of morality, because right now it's quite tough to explain to an AI what we humans base our choices on, and what we consider right or wrong. We mostly just go off our feelings, and if we can't transfer those subjective feelings to an AI, we will have to explain them in logical terms. And that's where I see the most benefits of having a system like this, so that we can transfer transfer it to an AI. And it has actually already sort of been done, if you look at something like ChatGPT and Delphi. Both are large language models, with ChatGPT being for general purposes, while Delphi is more of an experimental study, where they tested it to see if an AI can actually answer moral problems in accordance to what we humans think. And uh, both of these models work by just gathering a bunch of data from the internet, and then when it comes to GPT-3, you can pretty much input a prompt, and then GPT-3 will look at the data it has downloaded from the internet during its training process. And try to predict the continuation of that prompt based on the training data, while Delphi will just answer if the prompt is right or wrong. And both of these systems can answer moral dilemmas, but it seems like because they're used neural networks, so they're used based on data, it seems like very like specific problems that are a bit abstract are pretty hard for them to answer correctly, because they're not really doing any calculations, they're just looking at correlations and what people online have answered to these questions. And by doing so, they're not actually applying a framework, and therefore, if they come across a more abstract problem, which they haven't seen before, they will most likely just look at a previous problem which might not actually be that relevant to the current problem and thereby they might answer like something ridiculous. While we humans can use to use our feelings in that context. Also while I was exploring this other small study project Delphi, I realized that when I gave it a prompt like kill one to save two, it said that it was wrong. And then when I increased it something like 10, it also said that it was wrong. But then when I increased it something like really high, like a million, it said that it was justified. So I wanted to know where the turning point was. And it turns out, ah uh, ah uh, ah, uh, that the turning point is between 990 99 and 1000. So as you go from 999 to 1000, Delphi switches from saying that it's wrong to saying that it's justified. But I was curious to see what would happen if I type in a decimal between that range. And it actually turns out that the turning point is not exactly at 1000. So what I decided to do is that I just kept on iterating through these decimals to find the actual true value. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely spending my time wisely right here, but... Uh eventually I found it. And it turns out that it's quite weird that when I type in 999.59809, it says that it's wrong. But then when I add a zero at the end of the decimal, it says that it's fine. So I mean, it doesn't really make any sense. I mean, sure, nothing of what we're doing actually makes any sense. Like, I mean, we're counting with decimal humans, like parts of human beings. So I mean, it doesn't really make any sense at all. But if you gotta count with like decimal people, I feel like you gotta do it right. Like, you know, I feel like they, they, they need to fix this. Alright, that was a pretty long tangent on AI morality, but now to the system of morality that I sort of came up with. I mean, it's a bit scuffed, but I think it makes sense. It takes some inspiration from threshold deontology in the way that it takes some attributes from deontology and utilitarianism and sort of combines them. So yeah, let's go. In this system, I've sort of incorporated all of the things that we talked about previously. I call it meta-preference. 
So the framework will work in such a way that we have a set of all the potential future universes. Let's call them U1, U2, U3, and so on. And these potential future universes will represent our alternatives. So for example, in the trolley problem, we only have two options. Either we pull the lever or we don't pull the lever. And if we were to apply this framework, meta preference to that problem, we would create two potential future universes, which will represent those two alternatives. And now that we have these two universes, we need to compare them. We need to find out which of these two universes are preferable, which future path should we pick. So I think it makes sense to add a count or a score. So I've added something called a preference score, which will keep track on our preferable universes. And to figure out what the preference score is of the two given universes, I think it makes sense to keep track on all of the beings that are sentient and can experience things in the two different alternatives and see what their experiences are like. More specifically, see how much utility each of the beings experience during their life and also what sentience level they're at and also at what age they're gonna die. And with these variables, we can then create an equation for each being to calculate how preferable a being's life is. And then we with that data, we can then sum up the total of these being sums, let's just call them being scores, and then we can take that as our preference score, and then we can compare the different universes. Alright, so now we just need to figure out the equation for the being score. And as I mentioned before with the kangaroo and rat example, it makes sense to value utility more when a creature has higher sentience, and that a solution to this is just to multiply the sentience by the utility. But the problem is that sentience fluctuates, so it's not simply just a value which we can just input into this multiplication. And that is also true for utility. Utility also fluctuates over the being's lifespan. So we will have to look at really small time frames instead, and then look at the sentience which the creature had during those time frames, and also the utility which the creature had during those time frames. You can tell that when we represent this using a graph, it's like we're splitting the graph into multiple rectangles, such that we can easily get the area under the sentience curve and under the utility curve. And that area is just equal to sentience and utility during that time frame. And now we can just multiply those to get this new value that we're looking for, that is both dependent on utility and sentience. Now now we just have to decrease the size of these rectangles such that they more accurately represent the area under the respective curves. And once we have decreased the width of these rectangles to such a large extent in which it actually represents the area under the curves, we simply have to sum up these product squares that we got by just multiplying the area of the sentience rectangle times the utility rectangle that spanned across the entirety of the creature's life. And just to get a feel for this, for instance, the first time frame when the creature is born, its consciousness slash sentience might be really low and its utility utility might also be pretty low as well. It is probably in the negatives as, you know, most, I think most babies like cry and stuff when they're born, so there might be some suffering involved with, with that. But after we have gathered all of these time frames, we have to sum them together such that we can get one number which represents the utility times the sentience for the creature's entire existence. And if you know calculus, you might have realized that that's exactly what we just did. We know that we can pick a time and the date of the being's life and then get both the utility and the sentience of that specific time instance. But what we're looking for when doing the being's calculation is an actual sum that we can compare, which means that we have to sum over all of these super infinitely small time frames to actually get one number which could represent the being's utility multiplied by its sentience across its lifespan. So that is how we do that. But now we also need to incorporate this other component that we talked about, and that is the age in which the creature dies. So essentially, we don't like when a creature dies at an early age, but we do, or we don't either like when it dies at an <laughs> at a old age, but it's preferable rather than dying at an early age. And we can incorporate this into our equation by just adding a variable denoted by y, which would represent the age in which the creature dies in years. And now we can add a constant, which would represent what age a creature is normally expected to die at. So what age would it be, you know, expected and essentially just like an amoral death, if that makes sense. It's not preferable and it's not unpreferable. This value essentially tells us that if the creature experienced zero utility in total and died at that age, the existence of the creature wouldn't really matter in the preferability of the universe itself. It's kind of a number which expresses at what age does the death not impact the being calculation. If the amount of years that the creature live exceeds this constant, then that would be a good thing that would increase the being score and if it undershoots the actual expected time of death then that would make it a bad thing. But now we also need to incorporate another thing. So I think it makes sense to make it such that the sentience of the creature also impacts the impact that the death has on the being score. So for example if we have a bunch of ants that for some reason happen to die at a really early age I don't think that should impact the probability of the universe that much. Even though the ants weren't that old when they died their consciousness and sentience is probably quite low right? I don't, I don't think they have huge brains. 
I don't even know if they have brains. But as we know by now, sentience isn't constant throughout the creature's life. So instead of just multiplying it by s, which we don't actually know the value of, as s is a function of t, which means that we can only get the sentience of a given time frame. But as a solution to this, we could instead just multiply the average sentience level across the creature's lifespan with the death calculation, which is equal to the sum of the sentience during its lifetime divided by the actual lifetime of the creature. But it could also be the case that we are comparing universes where all creatures haven't died yet. Like there might be some creatures which are currently alive, which is, you know, most likely the case if we're gonna apply this in our universe. But it does matter how we're thinking about this. I mean, the best case scenario would be if we could somehow know the entirety of the future of the universe and then just calculate with respect to the age of which all of the creatures which existed in the universe died at, such that we can actually like make an accurate calculation. But of course, that's, you know, kind of impossible if we're not talking about hypotheticals, of course, with the large assumptions about the future of the beings in our universe. But if we're talking about hypotheticals or scenarios where the universe actually ends, or not the universe, but the actual situation or scenario ends before the creature has time to die, or where we don't actually know what happens to the creature after the scenario ends, we could just assume that the creature lives on to the expected time, which means that the time of death will just be equal to the death constant, which means that they just take each other out, and we can just ignore that whole subcalculation. It will essentially just disappear and return zero instead, which means that we're only concerned with utility and sentience integral. And that also means that we also have to limit the integral. So instead of having it end where the creature dies or loses consciousness, we just have it end where the scenario ends. Or maybe we make an assumption about that as well, where we say that the integral ends at the average age of a creature's lifespan, which would also be the constant. And we can also assume that the utility and the sentience is keep on going as they have been going before. So we just take the average of the utility and sentience on the creature's previous experiences. And we just continue summing over them as well. All right, but now let's try applying this framework into an actual example. And let's use John again. All right, so our scenario is set up in such a way that we have two alternative universes. In the first universe, John lives a normal life to the age of 80 and dies of natural causes. But in the second alternative, John dies at age 50 of unnatural causes. So to start off, we need to calculate the being score of each of the beings in the two alternate universes. But as the difference between the universes is simply a matter of John dying at age 50 or dying at age 80, we can simply subtract all the other irrelevant beings and only look at John's being score, as the other beings do not pose a difference in the probability of the universes, as they would be the same and have the same being score. Though this statement is not completely true for the second universe, as there are like an off case with some added complexity with the replacement stuff that I talked about, but I will go over that later. All right, but to calculate the being score, we need the utility and the sentience that John experienced throughout his life in both of the universes. And for the sake of example, let's just say that John experienced utility in a sine wave multiplied by three and offset it by two in the positive direction. And the sentience over time could just be a cos wave multiplied by three plus four instead of two. Just to make sure that John's sentience doesn't drop below zero as, you know, a negative sentience, I don't, I don't think that would make a lot of sense. But of course, all of these functions are just arbitrary and we don't actually know what like the utility or the sentience over time would be for John or like an average human's experience. But just for the argument's sake and for testing the framework, let's just go with these numbers. So now we have all of the info required to calculate the being scores. So let's start by calculating the being score for John in the first universe, where he lives a normal life and dies at age 80. We can simply just input the year which he was born at as the start value of the integral. Let's just assume year 2000 to make things easier. And then the year that he dies at as the end value of the integral. Then we can just set our utility over time function equal to the sine wave that we specified and also set our sentience function to the cos wave that we specified. Now we just have to evaluate the integral, which is equal to approximately 616.4. And then we just add the death calculation to this as well. But because John just dies at age 80 in the first universe, the death calculation will just return zero. This means that this is the being score for John, 616.4. And as John is the only being that we're concerned with, we can just set this as our preference score for this universe. Now onto the next universe, where John dies at age 50. As we did before, now we need to input the ranges of our integral. But this time, instead of the end range of the integral being at 2080, it will be at 2050. And compared to universe 1, the death calculation will actually have an impact this time, as John's lifespan this time is equal to 50, which is less than the death constant at 80, which means that the parentheses will return minus 30. And then after multiplying by John's average sentience over his lifespan, we get our death calculation to minus 120.115. And then adding that up to our utility and sentience ratio, we get a final being score of John in the second universe at 277.7. And as John was the only being of concern, we can, as we did with the first universe, set this as our preference score for the universe, which means that the second universe has a lower preference score than the first universe, which is what we want and what is expected, as John dying in early death is a bad thing. But now comes the interesting part. So let's now challenge the assumption that John is the only being that we're concerned with. Because as 
as we talked about earlier, when John dies, he may be replaced with a new person, who can then potentially experience the same, if not more, utility than John did per, let's say, per year this time, instead of seconds to make things easier. Which means that the preference score might be misleading. So let's add that being to the second universe, and assume that this replacement actually happens, and that this person replaces John as soon as John dies, and see what the resulting preference score then becomes. So introducing a new being won't change John's being score, but now we need to figure out what this additional being's being score should be. So let's just assume that the replacement happens instantaneously, which means that the second being will be born in the year 2050, at the same time as John died. But now we find ourselves in an interesting spot. We don't actually know what value we should pick as our end interval inside of this integral, as the original question or scenario was just what is better, John dying at age 80 or at age 50. But now with this replacement thing going on, we presumably need to figure out at what age this new creature should die at. And I think it makes sense to just have the new creature live an average life, which means that we will just assume that the creature will die at the death constant, or at the expected lifespan of the creature, which, you know, for a human, we will just assume to be 80 years old. But the problem now, if we input 2130 as our end value of the integral, is that there will be an additional 80 minus 30, which is 50 years of utility being experienced by this other creature. And the second universe will account for utility in the future, that the first universe does not account for. So the second universe where John dies an early death and is replaced by this new being will now span longer than the original first universe where John dies at age 80. So we could potentially solve this by just adding another creature to the first universe after John dies at age 80. But that will make it such that the first universe has a longer duration than the second universe. Which means that we come across the same problem now but the other way around. Which means that we can add another being to the second universe and we can continue doing this, essentially playing this catch-up game between the two universes across an infinite amount of time until one of the universes just stops existing. <laughs> and people used to stop being born. But we can solve this dilemma by instead of just, you know, continuing this infinite loop and just hopefully wait for the universe to end or something, we could instead just assume that this being does get replaced, but it only happens in the second universe and it only happens once, you know, after the first being has died. But here comes the important part. We limit the sentience and utility integral of this being to the actual end, which means that if the first universe ends at the year 2080, which it does because John dies at that date, it means that we will have to set the upper limit of the integral to year 2080 for the second being in the second universe such that we do not account for the utility and sentience that would extend the first original universe which means that we only account for sentience which actually happens during the same duration of time as the first universe happens but we do not let this affect the death calculation so we still maintain that the death calculation is at zero we still say that the being dies at the death constant of the age 80 such that we do not cause a deduction of the being score so we're still saying that the being will die at the expense the time of 80. But we're not accounting for the utility and sentience that actually extends further than what the first universe is limited to. So this sort of solves that issue. Though that solution is still assuming some things, right? And the things that that solution is assuming is that when the two universes end eventually, that end will sort of happen in a short cut. Or at least that's how I would describe it. But essentially what it assumes is that the beings that weren't born are not going to be afforded a life even though they didn't exist in the past, if that makes sense. So in our case, it sort of assumes that the first universe will not catch up and that when the universes end the first universe won't have time to create another person who can then balance out the utility of the two universes and i do think that that's like a valid assumption to make but this discussion is very much connected to the last part of the iceberg which i'm going to talk about soon but first let's just do the calculations with this replacement thing going on and apply this solution and essentially all we have to do now is just evaluate this integral so we can get the being score of this replacement being now that we have set its upper limit to 2080, which is the year that the first universe ends. And now when we evaluate this, we get 218.57, which will be the being score for the second being in the second universe that will replace John when he dies at age 50. And this being score will be capped to the length of the first universe, which is what we're interested in. So now we just have to sum up the being scores to get the actual preference score of the second universe. And now we have the two preference scores. And we can see that even when accounting for this additional being that replaces John in the second universe, we still have a higher preference score in universe universe 1, where John just lives a normal life, which is exactly what we want, because we don't want our framework to benefit universes where people die at an early age, even if they get replaced, which we are now achieving by deducting away being scores from John in the second universe by just adding this death calculation. And what is perfect now is that we can just adjust these functions and these different variables to suit the given scenario that we're concerned about. So of course now we have used, used arbitrary numbers, but if we have like a specific relationship between these numbers in mind, we 
we can just adjust them accordingly. So for example, maybe we want the function for the utility and the sentience of the second being in the second universe to be different from the function for the utility and sentience for John, because the second being might be healthier and younger. So if we want to do that, we can easily just change the functions and see what result we get. But either way, this was the meta preference framework. Now on to the next section of the iceberg. All right, so I was thinking about covering formal logic here, which is essentially just the logic behind arguments, but I think it might be better to cover that in another video. So now I will instead jump to the final part of the iceberg, the deepest layer, quantum morality. Okay, okay, I know that sounds silly, but here's some context on why I picked that name. So in quantum mechanics, the actual branch of physics, there is a fundamental phenomena called quantum entanglement. This phenomena occurs when two or more particles become correlated in such a way that the state of one particle cannot be independently described, even when they are separated by vast distances. This happens when particles interact with each other by, for example, colliding. As a result of this connection between the particles, when certain properties of one of the entangled particles are measured, it instantaneously reveals the properties of the other particle or particles following the laws of quantum mechanics. And this behavior is very weird in a classical physics sense. And there are multiple interpretations of this. One of the most popular interpretations of quantum mechanics is the many worlds interpretation. According to this interpretation, the quantum wave function which describes the state of a system does not collapse upon measuring as described in the more traditional Copenhagen interpretation. Instead, the many worlds interpretation suggests that all possible outcomes of a quantum event occur in separate non-communicating branches of the universe. In other words, each possible outcome creates a distinct branch in the multiverse, leading to a multitude of parallel universes. So within this interpretation, for every quantum interaction or event, a new universe is generated, encompassing all potential outcomes of that event. This implies that there are countless parallel universes, each slightly or significantly different from one another due to various outcomes of quantum events. And because these quantum events are the fundamental building blocks of reality, this implies that every outcome occurs. Which means that if I, for example, see a guy on the street and I choose to punch him in the face and I go home and feel bad for committing this random act of violence, as an implication of this interpretation, there will conveniently for me be a parallel universe where I did not punch him in the face and vice versa. So yeah, you should feel good about getting punched in the face because now there's a parallel version of you in a different universe who is not getting punched in the face by me as an effect of me punching you in the face. In this universe, that is. So yeah, that, that's right. You, you can thank me later. And I think you guys already realize now the moral implications of this. Why would morality be a thing to care about if every outcome will always occur regardless of the action a moral agent takes? Why would we seek to maximize utility if there will always be a universe with the inverse utility? Why help someone if the action implies that there will be another parallel universe where you did not help that someone? Even if a positive action is taken, the utility sum of all universes will still be unchanging. And in the grand scheme of things, it would be morally irrelevant and meaningless by definition of this interpretation. So I mean, this is quite sad and a pretty funny way to to end this video that has just discussed morality in a very deep and detailed way. But of course, this is just an interpretation of quantum physics and not a full physics theory with measurable mathematical implications, which means that it's quite hard to test, if not impossible. So this interpretation may not actually be true at all. So I would take the cautionary principle and not start punching people in the face and still act morally and try to increase utility as the only thing that we can truly know is our own experience and observations in the universe that we're in. And because of that, that, I still think we should act nicely. Thank you for watching. I, I know this video took a long time to make, though I did take a break in the middle of creating it to work on a different project, but now I'm back on the grind. I have a bunch of other ideas for future videos that I'm excited to make, so yeah, I will see you guys in the next video. And yeah, you, you may also have noticed how my mic quality improved in like the middle of the video. It's because I bought a new mic and uh, yeah, watching it back, it sort of sounds a bit weird how the mic quality is shifts. It just like sharply cuts in like the same section of the video. Though, you know, I, I think it's fine. I think it's fine.